I'm Quincy Newell, and you're listening to Gospel Tangents. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. Jane Manning James was a great friend of both Joseph and Emma Smith. In our next conversation with Dr. Quincy Newell, we'll talk about her request to be sealed as a daughter to the prophet. Her requests were never granted, but it did result in the most unusual, as in one and only time, a special sealing ceremony took place. Dr. Quincy Newell will talk more about this sealing and about Jane's repeated request to get temple ordinances such as the LDS endowment. Check out our conversation. I also want to remind you to please sign up for an, our newsletter. You'll get a copy. You'll have a chance to receive uh, the copy of this book uh, by Dr. Newell, Your Sister in the Gospel, and I'll be giving it away to the winner of a drawing. So in order to be in the drawing, just sign up for our newsletter at gospeltangents.com slash newsletter. If you're already in, you don't need to sign up again. But if you don't, if you'd like a copy of that, please sign up, gospeltangents.com slash newsletter. Now back to our conversation. So how did she come in contact with Mormon missionaries? So Jane joins the, the Congregational Church in 1841, and she say, says later in her autobiography that uh, she felt like she was missing something, that there was something more out there. And a year later, maybe, um, she hears a Mormon missionary preach. Um, Charles Wandell was in the area. He was, I think, the president of the Norwalk branch, which is not too far away. Um, and he seems to have come through sort of preaching, trying to get converts. And she went to hear him, and she was totally convinced. Um, and so she decides to be baptized and to join the church. So that was pretty straightforward. I know that Margaret said it created a few ripples in her congregation. Uh, the New Canaan Congregational Church was n not amused, I wouldn't <laughs> say. They, the records don't show us much, um, but there is an entry in 1843 saying that the congregation has withdrawn its watch and care over her because she has removed to someplace far away with the Mormons. Um, and there's a, a sort of Nauvoo, Illinois? Like, is that a thing? <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, I mean, th there's... Um, it's easy to sort of interpret that as, as them being up in arms, but it, it seems much more like a kind of record keeping, like, oh, she's gone, let's take her off the rolls okay. kind of thing. So this is about what year? That's 1843. 1843. Um, so she, that's when she joined the church? No, she joins the church in, 18, in winter of 1842, 41, 42, I think. Okay. Um, so, yeah. And then in 1843, they travel to... Uh, Nauvoo. So she just kind of tries to save up her money? Is that, is that the idea? My sense is, yeah. So her family owned land um, in Wilton, uh, Connecticut, and had a house there. Um, and so in the fall of 1843, they sell that land and that house. Now, who's they? Is that her mother? It is. Uh, so her father is dead. So um, it's her mother and several brothers and sisters. Um, there are some brothers and sisters-in-law. There's a stepfather. There's there's a whole... So it's a pretty big extended yeah, family. Yeah, exactly. Um, and Jane has brought, appears to have brought a bunch of them into the church as well. So they're all traveling together. They're all traveling with... Uh, Charles Wandell um, and an interracial group of converts, um, and so. Well, let me ask you a quick question ahead. there. I don't know if you had had the opportunity to see the new movie, or the recent movie Emma and Jane. I have not. Oh wow! Yeah. Well, that's that would be interesting because you you just said they were interracial in the movie. They portrayed it as a six to eight people, just black people. Okay. So there would have been more whites or just Charles Wandell. It's really hard to tell. Um, because we don't have any accounting of the full group. And Jane's recollection is always of, here are the black people who are in the group. And that's inconsistent. Um, but from, from Wilton, Connecticut, we know that uh, several of Jane's family, family members went, probably the entire family, um, and possibly a couple other black converts. Um, but they joined, they, they went from Wilton to Norwalk, and in Norwalk they're assembling this sort of interracial group of converts. So there seem to be several white converts as well okay. that Wandell is, is leading. Um, from Norwalk they go to uh, New York City and then up the Hudson River to Albany. 
from Albany, they probably take a train to Schenectady, um, which is only 16 or 17 miles away, but would have taken an entire day to get to on canal boat because they had to go through 20 some different locks, um, which takes a whole lot of time because there's a 200 plus uh, change in foot change in elevation um, between Albany and Schenectady. And then they're on the Erie Canal um, until they get to Buffalo. Um, so throughout that time, um, the group is, does seem to be interracial. There seem to be several white people traveling um, with the group as well as black people. Um, Sometime between when they get to Buffalo and when they get to some place in Ohio, um, the group gets split up. Um, so they're already traveling in segregated um, accommodations. Um, but at some point, the black people are refused passage altogether. Um, and Jane gives different accountings of where that place is. Um, and after that point, Charles Wandell continues on with the white converts. Jane sends her trunk with him, um, but the black people in the group walk from there to Nauvoo, um, so to several hundred miles. miles yeah, oh, yeah. This is awful. This just feels so terrible. I, I know that in, uh, Margaret had mentioned that uh, they their feet bled, and it was just it was terrible. Mm -hmm. So walking, so they walk for eight hundred miles from Ohio to Nauvoo. Right. Um, and then I understand that her trunk got lost. Her trunk got lost, or at least that's what Charles Wandell says. Um, and so in the Nauvoo Neighbor, the local paper, um, there is an ad that appears for several, re several weeks running. So the title is Lost, um, and it describes the trunk and offers a small reward for its return. Um, but Jane is essentially left without anything but the clothes on her back, um, which she finds to be a truly sorry state of affairs. Um, in part because I think she used her possessions as a way of kind of asserting her respectability. She, she describes the, the clothing in the trunk as beautiful clothes, mostly new, um, and she's left without all of them. Um, and so all she has are the shoes that have worn out, um, the stockings that have ripped and torn, the, the dress that she was wearing, um, and you know, very little else. Um, so she relies on the kindness of strangers. She needs to get a job. She needs to you know, get some new clothing, all of that kind of stuff. Well, I know in the movie, Emma and Jane, there's a, a really interesting scene um, where... Uh, Jane comes to meet the Prophet Joseph and Emma, and she um, is, I know she's pretty embarrassed, but she, she's like, I don't have any clothes. And Joseph says, let's go get her some clothes, Emma. <laughs> and so it's really kind of, a, can you tell about that story? I, you know, the, um, her autobiography talks about that. And so I think, um, th is it Mel Larson who, who wrote the screenplay for yeah, Jane I and Emma? Yeah, so. Um, it sort of fleshes out this incident, I imagine. Um, obviously, having not seen the film, I, I can only imagine. Um, but and you have to kind of fill in those details, right? Um, but Jane talks about Joseph Smith in particular in Nauvoo as somebody who is gracious and welcoming and um, a sort of father figure for her um, in a way that's really important to her um, and somebody who gives her a home and who gives her a job and um, who with with Emma um, really sort of gives her a place in that society. Um, so Jane portrays that as a way of um, kind of settling her into um, a, a sort of extended religious family in a way. Um, yeah, I mean, you can tell from the movie that she really had a great love for, for Joseph Smith. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And so, yeah. Um, and of course, the, uh, what's the word? The most interesting uh, experience in this time with Joseph was this supposed offer where they offered her to be adopted into the family. Can you talk a little right. bit about that? Sure. So. We don't hear anything about this from Jane until probably the 1880s, um, at which point she starts telling anyone who will listen um, that Emma came to her and offered, said that Joseph Smith had told her, Emma, to offer to Jane the opportunity to be adopted as a child. And Jane, at the time, uh, said, no thanks. 
Um, but starting in the 1880s, she starts petitioning church leaders to say, you know, I'd really like to change my mind about that. <laughs> Could I please be adopted to Joseph Smith as a child, as he offered to do back in Nauvoo? Um, and, you know, would that be okay? When can that be accomplished? Um, and it, now, this was not a legal adoption, but a religious adoption. Is that so correct? So that's how Jane frames it, okay. right? Um, and so at the, at the time that Jane says the offer was being made, um, parent-child sealing, um, which is sort of how she frames it in the 1880s, was not really a thing. It was at least theoretically a thing, but it was not a thing that had been practiced. Um, so nobody is really doing this. Um, by the 1880s, lots of people are doing it. Um, and lots and lots of white people are petitioning to be adopted as Joseph Smith's children. They never laid eyes on Joseph Smith. He was dead long before they became converts to the church. Um, and their, their requests are being granted right and left. Like this, I think probably thousands of people were adopted. He's got a huge family. Um, so, so Jane is, is basically asking for what lots of other people are getting as sort of a matter of course. Oh, really? It's yeah. It's just a widespread thing by It's that. a very widespread thing. Um, and so, so she's just asking for something that everybody else is getting. Um, but church leaders find this a really difficult request to grant I in her imagine. case. Um, because I think because they, they have a lot of trouble imagining giving Joseph Smith a black daughter in eternity. But she just keeps kind of poking them. Um, and so she, um, she writes letters to them. She has friends write letters to them. She goes to visit the, the church presidents in their homes. Um, she, you know, she talks about this at, at every opportunity. It's in her autobiography. It's in like every account of her life. Um, she sort of states this over and over again. And she seems to make the argument that she should be allowed to have um, a ceiling to Joseph Smith as a child. Um, she should be allowed to receive her endowments because she has been a virtuous Mormon woman and because Joseph Smith would let her do this. So why won't the church leaders at the time uh, let her do that? Um, and eventually the church leaders, I think, just kind of get tired of this. And so they finally decide, okay, well, we're we still don't think that you should be adopted to Joseph Smith as a child, but we will create a new ceremony for you um, that will seal you to Joseph Smith as a servant. And so on May 18, 1894, so that's 125 years and like a month ago, um, Zina D.H. Young um, and Joseph F. Smith go to the temple um, with an officiant and a couple of witnesses and into a ceiling room. Jane is not allowed to go into the ceiling room. So she's alive and well a few blocks away from the Salt Lake Temple where this ceremony is being performed on her behalf without her active participation. Um, and Jane is, a, the verb is attached to Joseph Smith as a servant uh, in eternity. Um, I think that there's some debate among scholars about whether this is a sealing ceremony or something else. I think it's a sealing ceremony because the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles discusses it as a sealing ceremony, um, even though they don't use quite the same language. Um, I think the change in the language really indicates to us how uncomfortable they were with the whole thing. Um, and the fact that that ceremony has only ever been performed once, as far as we know, shows us again just sort of how dissatisfied they were with the whole thing. Um, they, I think they didn't find it a useful way of structuring eternal relationships, but they left it in place. She was sealed to Joseph Smith as a servant. Now, who was the prophet at this time? Was it Wilf? Wilf? Sounds like Woodruff, I believe. Is that I believe so, yes, 1894. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a big year because that was the year the Genealogy Society of Utah was also created. So that's that's very interesting. So, yeah. Do we have any of her reactions to this? Uh, all we know is that she continued to petition for sealing as a child afterwards. So oh, right. I think that she was so also she was not, not satisfied. satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. She sounds like she was a real character. That's that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
since we're talking about sealing, you know, and especially Nauvoo, that was kind of where polygamy literally blew up. Mm -hmm. uh, and so do we have a sense for her knowledge of polygamy in Nauvoo? Uh, yes. She says in her autobiography that um, the Lawrence sisters and Maria and Sarah Lawrence and the other sisters who were there. Partridge. The Partridge sisters. Thank you. Um, we're sitting with her one afternoon and said, well, what would you think if a man had more than one wife? And Jane says she jumped up and clapped her hands and said, I think that would be great. Um, I'm not quoting her exactly there, but it's pretty close. There was hand clapping. Mm -hmm. um, and they say, well, well, we are all Brother Joseph's wives. Um, and she, the way she frames her um, acceptance of this news is as if, it is completely unproblematic, um, which I find really interesting, yeah. right? Polygamy was really hard for a lot of people. Um, and so for Jane to just sort of openly accept it um, is really interesting. Um, now, she's telling this story sometime between 1902 and 1908. That's when this version of the story comes out. Um, and so I think that... that um, that her version of the story has a lot to do with um, trying to per portray herself as a friend to Joseph Smith, as somebody who um, he liked and who liked him. Um, and so she's trying to, to create this kind of intimate relationship, not intimate in a sexual way, but just as a sort of familiar relationship, um, so that so that she can persuade church leaders to let her be sealed in the temple and get her endowments and stuff. Um, so, so in that sense, um, she may have glossed over um, some of the uh, more problematic aspects of her own reaction to, to that idea. Um, but she does not critique it at all. I say in the book that she may have had a really different understanding of what polygamy would mean um, than than white women might have at the time. Um, and that's because African Americans' access to marriage and relationship to state-sanctioned marriage um, was really different in uh, the antebellum United States. Um, it was a lot harder for African Americans to have a legally recognized marriage. Um, and so there was a, a range of what historian Tara Hunter calls marriage-like relationships um, that may have been more familiar to Jane than they were, would have been to white women um, who were around her. Um, so we know that at least two of Jane's siblings um, had people that they thought of as spouses, people that were socially recognized as their spouses. Um, there are no records of those marriages, though. Um, so those may not have been legally recognized uh, unions. Um, by the same token, sometimes people managed to get married, but they didn't manage to keep that marriage going for whatever reason. Maybe somebody was forced to move. Maybe somebody was it's sold. Slavery. Yeah. Um, and so, and so there may have been, um, people who ended up being, uh, serial monogamists, um, but who were legally married or at least socially recognized as married to more than one person at a time. Um, and so that was in some ways more socially acceptable um, among African Americans before the Civil War um, than it was among white people. Well, certainly the white slave masters wouldn't recognize these marriages. They were, in fact, Not they wanted to sell somebody, right. so they were going right. to sell somebody, break up a family. Right. And, and so that, that seems very common. Um, so I can understand a little bit why the, <laughs> they had to adapt right. <laughs> to, to these horrible circumstances. Right, right. Now, Latter-day Saints were not in those horrible circumstances, right? This was a, a totally different situation. But that format for um, loving relationships between men and women might have been more familiar to Jane um, and less uncomfortable, maybe. Hmm, that's very interesting. I hadn't thought of that. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Quincy Newell. In our next conversation, we'll talk about Jane's pioneer journey to Utah. Her house was located in what is now a very prime spot of real estate in Salt Lake City.
<laughs> well, for, fo for folks who don't live in Salt Lake, I think it's really helpful to see sort of how things are, yeah. are laid out. Um, but I, I actually think that Jane's first house in Salt Lake was probably where the conference center is now. Um, oh, really? Given, given the, the geographical description of it, um, that seems to be where it would be. Really? Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. Wow. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please support Gospel Tangents and become a subscriber. For just $5 a month, go to uh, patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview. And you can also get uh, transcripts available at either our Amazon website or if you want to give the money to me and not Amazon, please subscribe on my website at gospeltangents.com and you can click the yellow subscribe button. Of course, we're also on Facebook, Twitter, and all the other places. Uh, make sure you subscribe on iTunes at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents. And don't forget to click here to subscribe on YouTube here for a transcript. And over here, we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again for listening.